This is Common Sense Radio. Straightforward and no excuses. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Call me crazy. What I said was perfectly right and spot on accurate. Boy's got a mouth like a cannon. Always shoot the door. Stop, 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 stop. 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 I mean, you're way off, Skip. Hey, boy. Yeah, you know, it's not cynical. It's common sense. Pay attention to me when I'm talking to you. Genuine, accountable, and wrong. Here is Steve Gruber. And Monday, welcome to it, my friends. Glad to have you on board. There's a lot to get to today. A tremendous amount to get to today, but, but I have to start here. I have to start here because if we don't clear the table to start with, you know, we're not going to make much progress this week. So we have to work our way through this one. And what I'm talking about, it's been a very long weekend with people from the Spartan nation walking around with that thousand yard stare. You know, the look of the shell shock Spartan fans still trying to wake up from a horrible nightmare where the men's basketball team defeats the little regarded middle Tennessee team by 15 or 20 points. But sadly, there is no shaking of the of the devastating loss, a nine-point loss to the Blue Raiders, one of the biggest upsets in the history of college basketball, and that image isn't going to go away anytime soon. It was slow, ugly, and hard to watch. It's something you don't soon forget. The Spartan stunning loss, however, will be felt for the next two weeks by a lot more than the team and the fans. Usually, by the end of the first weekend, like today, the Spartans are studying the team they will play in the Sweet 16. People this time of the year are decked out in green far past St. Patty's Day with a little air on their step. Shirts and hats and blankets fly off the shelves. Not this year. Tom Izzo's teams have advanced deep into the tournament many years with teams that were not nearly as loaded and, and talented as this one. Around the state, bars would be full of cheering fans. People would stock up on great food for the next couple of rounds. Travel agents would be booking tickets to the next city on the way to the Final Four. This year, it's just the sound of silence. This year, those normally ringing, jingling cash registers and jovial fans are silent. The economic impact is devastating and stretches far across the state. Think about all of the lost revenue. Not just the bars and house parties, but hotels, caps and shirts and bumper stickers, and the list goes on and on, and it all adds up. I'm guessing the economic impact of a first-round loss by the team many had picked to win it all is millions and millions of dollars. You can't really put a price on heartbreak, because if you could, the Spartan Nation might be in the hole for years to come. Tough loss for the Spartans at Middle Tennessee to say the least. We'll talk about that with Mad Dog coming up a little bit later in the program. One of the biggest, it is one of the biggest, we'll tell you how close it comes to being the biggest upset in NCAA history. Um, but I can tell you it is right there. It is right there. All right, still on the, um, On the radar for today, Donald Trump will be meeting with top Republicans in Washington today. Donald Trump will be meeting with top Republicans in Washington today. Um, Nearly two dozen of them in one room with the hope of improving relations with the GOP establishment and, and planning a route to the presidency. The GOP frontrunner will be in the nation's capital to speak at the annual conference for APEC. That is the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. It's the pro-Israel group, pro-Jewish group. Trump's meeting with Republican lawmakers and other party leaders was first reported in the Washington Post, and it'll be his first major discussion with them since last fall when he was on Capitol Hill to protest President Obama's Iranian nuclear agreement, which is still proven to be a disaster, by the way. The -the off-the-record meeting was reportedly organized in part by Alabama Senator Jeff Sessions, who has endorsed Trump, as you know. The names of the attendees have not yet been released, but Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, appearing yesterday on Fox News Sunday, said that he'll be in his home state of Kentucky, so he won't be there. And I would say, and so what? 
You know what's funny? I sit here and I and I watch you know a lot of this stuff as you know and you sit there and you hear people he's not conservative enough. Donald Trump isn't conservative enough. Well, really? Is Mitch McConnell conservative enough? How about John Boehner? Is he conservative or was he conservative enough as Speaker of the House? Paul Ryan, is he, is he conservative enough? A guy that just let a $1.1 trillion piece of garbage bill go through? Seriously, was George W. Bush conservative enough? A guy who, in retrospect, like it or not, took the nation into a war that was not a good idea, looking back, who spent money as fast as Barack Obama adding up trillions to the national debt. Was George W. Bush conservative enough? You know, when you look at things like immigration, trade, and the economy, the three things that are really getting the attention of voters, illegal aliens crashing the gate, Trade that has cost how many millions of people here in Michigan their jobs and the economy in general. I would say that giving America a secure border is a pretty conservative place to be. Making sure we're not getting screwed on trade deals that make no sense to anybody but the crony capitalists that are lining their pockets. Sounds pretty conservative to me. And in fact, we have Nolan Finley here on the program a bit later, the editor of the Detroit News. Talking about what needs to be done to control it, to control the Republican Party. Because it's not conservative enough. Well, from that point of view, I would say this. George Washington, in his farewell address, which is really a long letter, but it became known as his farewell address, wrote about the concerns of political parties, basically saying people become more dedicated and loyal to the political party than they would be to their own fellow countrymen, to their own nation. The party would come first and not the country, and that's what's happened. And this notion that somehow you're not conservative enough, you can't, you know, you can't be the, the standard bearer for the Republican Party because you, know, you don't pass this litmus test. Well, whose litmus test? I mean, is Trump more or less conservative than, say, Bob Dole? Isn't that a question worth asking? If you're going to sit there and hold him to this standard, well, he's not conservative enough. Based on what, what test? And did your other candidates were they were they subjected to this test? Because right now, looking at the numbers, we have a couple of contests tomorrow. Let's see, uh, Arizona, uh, and some others coming up, and then it's New York and California, and big tests. We kind of a, kind of a lull here. No Super Tuesday type events, but a lull here for a bit. Trump's going to steamroll Arizona. Why? Because the, the Border Patrol agents came out, the union came out and said, we can't endorse anybody. But if we could, the only person that has our back on the border is Donald Trump. Is that conservative enough? I don't know. I'm just asking. Because at some point, the Republican establishment is going to have to come to reality. And that is you set up the game. And this guy played it better than you. Deal with it. Monday on the Steve Gruber Show. Getting your day started with news from around the state and around the world. Common Sense Radio. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Monday, so good to me. Monday morning, it was all I hoped it would be. Welcome to it. It is Monday. By the way, looking down the road to Wednesday afternoon. Wednesday afternoon. A uh, big storm coming. A uh, clash of the titans apparently is going to happen right here in Michigan. Um, warm, moist air from the south. Cold air pushing back from the northeast. Could create conditions. Uh, the line will be somewhere between maybe south of Holland, just south of Lansing, extending towards Troy and Pontiac. And then from there, north. Heavy, wet snow. It could start as rain and freezing rain, but then heavy, wet snow. Flint and Burton, Mount Mount Pleasant, Alma, Midland. Some areas could see well over a foot of snow. Some 
Some models showing as much as 18 inches of snow in places like Clare or Midland. Maybe extending over towards Tawas City and so forth. So um, this is your first warning. Other weather could be on, you know, updates could happen. But this is a big storm. They're warning us two days out. Um, travel problems, power outages, and, and so on and so forth. You know, so there it is. Um, spring came early, but then it left for a bit. And it's going to leave us a big pile of possibly a big mess. And, of course, this time of year it comes with flooding as well. Uh, here's one of the best columns I've read in a long time. And I, and I want to read this from Pat Buchanan, a conservative, hardcore conservative that ran for president. Pat Buchanan wrote, when Trump beats Hillary, if his poll numbers should hold, Trump will be there six months from now when the Sweet 16 is cut to the Final Four, and he will likely be in the finals. My prediction in July of 2015 looks pretty good right now. Here with a second prediction. Republican wailing over his prospective nomination aside, Donald Trump could beat Hillary Clinton like a drum in November. Indeed, only the fear that Trump can win explains the hysteria in this city. Who's been telling you that for a while? Not Pat Buchanan, me, yours truly. In the Washington Post, March 18th, as a moral question, it is straightforward. The mission of any responsible Republican should be to block a Trump nomination and election. The Orwellian headline over that editorial, to defend our democracy, the GOP must aim for a brokered convention. Beautiful. Defending democracy requires Republicans to cancel the democratic process and decision of the largest voter turnout of any primaries in American history. And this is now a moral imperative for Republicans only. Like the third world leaders at lectures, the Post celebrates democracy so long as the voters get it right, in their opinion. Whatever one may think of the Donald, he has exposed not only how far out of touch our political elites are, but how insular is the audience that listens to our media elite. Understandably, Trump's rivals were hesitant to take him on, seeing the number one, uh, the number that he did on Little Marco, Low Energy Jeb, and Lion Ted. But the big media, the Post, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, have been relentless and ruthless. Yet Trump's strength with voters seems to grow with the savagery of their attacks. As for National Review, the Weekly Standard, and the accredited conservative columnists of the big op-ed pages, their hostility to Trump seems to rise commensurate with Trump's rising polls. As the Wizard of Oz was exposed as a little man behind a curtain with a big megaphone, our media establishment is unlikely ever again to be seen as a formidable force as it once did. And the GOP? Those Republicans who assert that a Trump nomination will be a moral stain, a scarlet letter, the death of the party, they're most likely describing what a Trump nom nomination would mean to their own ideologies and interests. Barry Goldwater lost 44 states in 1964, and the GOP fell to less than a third in Congress. The Republican Party is dead, wailed the Rockefeller wing, when actually only the Rockefeller wing would turn out to be dead. After the Great Yellowstone Fire in the summer of 1988, the spring of 89 produced astonishing green growth everywhere. 1964 was the Yellowstone Fire for the GOP, burning up a million acres of dead wood, preparing the path for party renewal. Renewal often follows rebellion. Republican strength today on Capitol Hill and in state offices is at levels unseen since Calvin Coolidge. Turnout in the GOP primaries has been running at levels unseen in American history, period. While turnout in the Democratic primaries is well below what it was in the Obama-Clinton era race of 2008. This opportunity for Republicans should be a cause for rejoicing, not all this weeping and gnashing of teeth. If the party in Cleveland can bring together the Trump, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, and John Kasich forces, the White House, Supreme Court, and Congress are all within reach. Consider, Clinton was beaten by Bernie Sanders here in Michigan and pressed in Ohio and Illinois on her support for NAFTA and the trade deals of the Clint, Bush, and Obama eras that eviscerated American manufacturing and led to the loss of millions of factory jobs and the stagnation of wages. Sanders' issues are Trump's issues. A Trump campaign across the industrial Midwest, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey featuring attacks on Hillary Clinton's support for NAFTA, the WTO, MFN for China, and her backing of amnesty and citizenship for illegal immigrants and for the Iraq and Libyan debacles is a winning hand. Lately, 116 architects and subcontractors of the Bush first and second foreign policy took their own version of the Oxford Oath. They will not for, vote for nor serve in a Trump administration. 
talking heads are bombing up on cable TV to declare that if Trump is the nominee, they will not vote for him and may vote for Clinton. This is not unwelcome news. Let them go. Their departure testifies that Trump is offering something new and different from the foreign policy failures this crowd did so much to produce. The worst mistake Trump could make would be to tailor his winning positions on trade, immigration, and intervention to court such losers. While Trump should reach out to the defeated establishment of the party, he cannot compromise the issues that brought him where he is or embrace the failed policies the establishment produced. This would be throwing away his aces. The Trump campaign is not a hostile takeover of the Republican Party. It is a rebellion of shareholders who are voting to throw out the corporate officers and board of directors that ran the company into the ground. Only the company here is the United States of America. You know, and I think Pat Buchanan did, did, wrote that very well. Uh, you can find Pat Buchanan. It's uh, on the American Conservative website. There you have it. You going to follow the failed policies of those that brought us here? No, sir. No, sir. 25 after on a Monday at the Steve Gerber Show. Michigan, born and raised with Midwestern values and Michigan common sense. All right, welcome back to it on a Monday. Sorting it out to get your week started. That's what we're doing here. Before we get uh, pummeled by this huge storm headed our way, Wednesday, Thursday. We'll keep you up to date on that as it gets closer. Uh, On the hotline uh, right now, Ron checking in in Traverse City. Ron, welcome to the program. Good morning. Glad to have you. What's on your mind? <laughs> uh, well, I was just uh, the uh, the only thing that ever, they're all worried about, all the politicians, they're worried about us or about Trump disrupting the party or breaking it up the party. But they're, you know, everybody wants them because they want them to disrupt the party that they are all having on us taxpayers. Well, they're here's the thing. To be servant. Yeah, because I don't think it's just the Republicans, obviously. The Democrats are right. in full-on panic as well. You know, so it has to, I mean, what are these people all afraid of? I mean, the, the Democrats are so worried that they have to keep attacking him. I mean, the, the old rule of thumb is pretty simple. If your opponent is self-destructing, get out of the way. Um, but they're not getting out of the way. They're, they're getting in there. They're throwing jabs. They're sending thousands of people to, you know, block highways in Arizona and the nonsense that went on over the weekend again, trying to protest him. If he's so bad, what are they so afraid of? Is my question. That makes sense. That, that they're gonna, you, yeah. Mm-hmm. That that's what they're afraid of because it's gonna disrupt their paychecks. Exactly, and disrupt the little party they've got going on. And as you said, Ron, they're partying in your, in your checkbook and mine. Uh, right, we're putting the party on basically, and that's they're right. enjoying it. That's right, Ron. Thanks for checking in, my friend. Greatly appreciate you listening there in Traverse City. Uh, that'll be one of the places getting pounded with snow, I think, but not as much as some places to the to the east. Uh, our good friend Alan Sachs, the professor of political science at the University of Texas Arlington, joining me now on the on the program. Professor, welcome back. Good morning. Thank you very much. So um, here we are. And I keep seeing um, uh, opinion piece after opinion piece. Trump will win. Trump will lose. Trump is the best candidate. Trump has no shot. Um, and, and the panic on both sides is fascinating. And then there's a professor from Pepperdine that writes, if Donald Trump wins, then clearly the uh, Electoral College should step in and nullify that victory and let the state legislatures vote because we couldn't let Trump win. I mean, my God, <laughs> it's like nothing I've ever seen before. And Pepperdine, I think, is a pretty conservative school from what I understand. Yeah, the, the, this professor... Uh, suggested that it's increasingly likely that this kind of scenario, this is what the founding fathers were worried about, is is Donald Trump. So therefore, the um, Electoral College should nullify the vote and just uh, vote themselves and pick a different president. They could do it, of course. He's right about that. But um, should they do it? Absolutely not. Uh, if Donald Trump becomes president, and there's really a pretty good chance of that happening, I think he will be a different person than he was as a campaigner. And what do you mean by that? What do you think he would be? I think he would settle down a little bit. I think he'd still be very brash and and strong. But I think if he surrounds himself with some good advisors and people, and I don't know whether he's willing to do that or not, but that's so critical to becoming president of the United States. If he has some good advisors, a good cabinet, 
and lets them do their thing and understand a little bit of American history and where we've been and where, where we and where we need to go, I think he would be just fine. But that's a big jump. I, I, I really, I'm just guessing, like everybody else is guessing. It's, it's difficult to get into somebody's mind, and especially somebody like Donald Trump. But if he comes into office, he should become something a little bit different than what he is at the present time. Well, here's, uh, here's something that it, uh, I was reading this piece by Pat Buchanan in uh, The American Conservative. I just read part of it on the air, in fact. Uh, and he says, here's the latest, 116 architects and subcontractors of the Bush 1 and Bush 2 foreign policy took their own version of the Oxford Oath. They will not vote for nor serve in a Trump administration. And Pat Buchanan says, let them go. Their departure testifies that Trump is offering something new and different from the foreign policy failures this crowd did so much to produce. The worst mistake Trump could make at this point would be to tailor his winning positions on trade, immigration, and intervention to court these losers. This is Pat Buchanan. He's not exactly a lefty. No, that, that is correct. <laughs> that yeah. is correct. And he said he, Trump should stay on the winning track and not court these losers. And I'm like, wow, that was just written. I picked that up yesterday. I mean, there are a fair amount of notable conservatives like Pat Buchanan that are on the Trump train. Absolutely. Well, you remember Pat Buchanan, when he ran for the presidency, he had sort of an insurgency similar to Donald Trump's. Correct. Uh, you remember they were they calling him... The people with pitchforks were were on were on Pat Buchanan's side, so he was sort of a different version of Donald Trump, but he was much the same thing. So I can easily see why he is a um, Donald Trump supporter. A firebrand he was, and like Absolutely. Trump is. So all right, so let me ask you: We were watching again this weekend, um, uh, and if not for television cameras, nobody would know or care that there's you know two streets shut down in New York City, um, and then they're blocking highways in was it Arizona? Uh, the anti-Trump people, which everybody knows are Hillary and Bernie supporters. So you, you, when the when the cameras go close up on this crowd, people can decide for themselves what they're dealing with and whether they want to support the people that are blocking the highway or the people that are just trying to drive down the highway to go see Donald Trump or go to work or do whatever. And you have to believe that all of this is very well organized. Of course but, it is. Uh, George you know, Soros it, is... It, it's very well organized. And uh, I think if the public begins to understand that, maybe more of them will go to Donald Trump. I'm interested to see what's going to happen tomorrow. There are three primary states, I think, tomorrow, Arizona, Utah, Idaho. And by the way, there's 22 other states that still have not had primaries. And that will be interesting to see if Donald Trump can continue with his uh, winning ways. If he can, I think that's going to be extremely interesting. The question is... When he goes at Hillary Clinton, will he go at Hillary Clinton full blast, or will he simply uh, full political blast, or will he backtrack a little bit because she's a woman and doesn't want any feedback? I, I, I don't know. And that'll be interesting. I'm waiting to see what he's going to do with Hillary Clinton. Well, and he, here's the thing that I'm, I'm concerned about before we get to that, though. His, his, you know, And I thought John Kasich was a pretty decent candidate, had the right uh, resume and so forth. Uh, but I get the feeling he's gone full-on delusional for us. Yeah, John Kasich, I remember you liked him at the very start, and he, and he seemed to be really good. I mean, everything was, you know, if you just looked at his um, resume, his resume, yeah. it would be terrific. I want to use the academic thing, Vita. I hate that expression, the Vita, you know. Right. Uh, he would look very, very good. But the more he talks, he almost seems like a psychologist that he does anything else. He wraps people in his arms and he talks about them in a personal way and he, he, he's almost on the verge of tears sometimes. He's a good man and he certainly knows economics. He knows he was the head of the House Budget Committee I think for many, many years. Been a very good governor of, of Ohio. And on, on most issues he sounds strong, but he's not Donald Trump and he's not even Ted, Ted Cruz for that matter. Yeah, you know, and so the, they're, they're, but he's staying in the, um, he's staying in the race. He's staying in the race, even though he has no way to win, simply saying, well, I believe we're going to get to a contested uh, convention. Well, I can assure you, you get to a contested convention, the Ted Cruz forces and the Donald Trump forces will say, absolutely not. They're not going to put up with, with what you're offering. Anyhow, hold your thought right there, Professor. Okay. We'll have a couple more thoughts um, on this race with... Professor Alan Sachs, he uh, 
He educates students on political science or does his best, probably pulls his hair out more than anything, at the University of Texas Arlington. Back in just a moment right here on the Steve Gruber Show. Taking a closer look at the stories that affect you most with a big dose of common sense. Welcome back to it. It is Monday on the Steve Gerber Show. We have Alan Sachs, a professor of political science at the University of Texas Arlington with us today. You know, the Republican intelligentsia uh, thumbing its nose at Trump, even making the argument that Hillary in the White House would be better is mind numbing. I mean, this is the Hillary Clinton who wants to raise taxes to 50% or more, favors abortion on demand with no exceptions, wants trillions of new spending and debt, would shut down America's oil, gas, and coal production altogether, will double down on Obamacare, and was the architect of a, of a failed foreign policy in many lands in her policy of leading from behind. But other than that, apparently these Republicans, these conservatives, think that she is conservative enough, and I just sit there and go, what are you talking about? But don't you know that Hillary Clinton will fight for us? Oh, my ass. <laughs> as, as, as her fa- favorite phrase, that uh, she will fight for us. Yeah, she won't fight for me. <laughs> uh, I'm irrelevant to her. I, I'm just uh, I'm just uh, uh, somebody who can produce tax dollars for her her quest of uh, utopia. That's all I am. I heard her interview uh, the other night with uh, Chris Matthews on MSNBC. Oh, that had to be stunning. It shows you what kind of a life I lead. But um, it was interesting. He almost, almost asked her some pretty hard questions, but then he let up. Yeah. You know, he was right right there, and then he let up. He was talking about... Uh, Libya and parts of the Middle East where he where she had left uh, uh, a catastrophe behind her as Secretary of State, but she literally filibustered him. She just kept talking and talking and talking and talking, and uh, something like I do all the time, but I'm not running for president. And um, then he didn't follow up on it. He was almost there, but he wouldn't follow up on it. Do Republicans about- not get it? I, I mean, and I get what you're saying. She filibusters through it, and, and, and the Republicans have the nerve to say that she would be better than Donald Trump, which is nauseating. But here's what the Republicans fail to realize. At the beginning of this race, back in June, before Trump got into the race, who was leading in the polls? Jeb Bush. Right, right, right. correct. Yeah, Jeb Bush, raising hundreds of millions of dollars, whatever. Um, and here comes this guy. They're polar opposites. Polar opposites. And this guy, low-energy Jeb, which stuck... Like mud. Jeb Bush wouldn't have won this election if he had a billion dollars because his message is wrong. This guy's message is resonating. And now that he's attracting Democrats and people across the aisle, uh, the Republicans are treating him as a demagogue. Well, they're all, they're low information racists. I mean, really? This is what you're doing to your own front runner. Well, you know what John Kasich and I think even Jeb Bush believe somewhere in their brain about like, I believe I'm going to win the lottery is that the convention is going to be deadlocked somehow, and the convention will turn to them. In fact, John Kasich almost says as much. He, he, he does. Uh, That's what I say. Is he almost delusional? And, He's and, not going to be the... That's the, right. And Jeb Bush, the same thing. You remember there was a very famous statement that Jeb Bush made early on, and I kept wondering, what in the world does he mean by this? He said, you lose the primary, but you win the election. I kept thinking, what in the world is he talking about? Well, that's what he's talking about, a brokered convention. Or a contention, or an open convention, whatever one wants to name it, and uh, I think the same thing is true about John Kasich. He really believes that they're going to turn to him, and if that happens, uh, the Republicans have definitely lost because all the Donald Trump supporters are going, to st- are going to stay home. Yeah, they're not going to come at all. And now there's this this pushing. Well, you know, all the Bernie voters are going to vote for Hillary. No, they're not. You know, the, the, this is the new narrative from the left and the, the left wing media that works for them. But Bernie's going to campaign for. Her. In, in, in fact, she said so openly. She has said, uh, she's talked to Bernie openly through the press, essentially, and said, um, you, ne- you need to campaign for me as I campaigned for Barack Obama when I lost to him. And she needs Bernie. And Bernie, I think, will be out there trying to get a lot of young people over, but I don't think he's going to be all yeah, that Yeah, they're going to sleep in. They're going to sleep right. in on Election Day, I guarantee it. You know? right. I mean, come on. You can you, you can't smoke that much you can't smoke that much and expect to stay awake that long. I'm just telling you. That is probably you know, true. You know, I mean, after that midnight run to Taco Bell, I mean, what the hell are you gonna do with yourself? <laughs> That's right. You know, uh, you know what I, I I think it's beautiful. You know, if um, oh, you know, if uh, David Crosby has a ponytail and he's seventy, that's one thing. But that's the crew that I see 
Because uh, I look. I mean, let's be honest. If you look at somebody drive by, they got a Bernie sticker in their car, you look. You're like me. You look, who is that person? You know, it's really, there was a classic sign from one of the demonstrations, I think, in Arizona or earlier on somewhere, maybe in Utah. And it showed a, a guy with, I think, a sort of a cowboy hat on and a big beard, and he looked tough. And he's facing off with a with another man who has that bun in the back, <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> the very famous bun. Oh yeah! And it was a great photograph. It wasn't a photograph, but it was on television. Right, I guess, right. Look, oh, that that says it all. <laughs> well, that's that's what I'm saying. You know, if you're 70 years old, it's probably time to uh, lose <laughs> the ponytail or the bun. That's it's, right. It's, you know, I'm sorry. I do I'm, not. I do not wear a ponytail, but. I'm, but you've got the bun? I have the age, but I yeah. but no no bun, no just, ponytail. Just checking, Professor. You know, I just want to make sure that... It is short. It is very short hair. And, and, and while we're at it, you know, once you see the Bernie uh, sticker on the bumper, then you see 27 other bumper stickers on the same car. You're like, what, what is wrong? Why, why is this every, every, you know, Earth first and, you know, and all these different things that are right there and, you know, um, justice warrior. Um or, or social or, warrior, socialist there's a warrior. There's sticker yet that I really, really dislike. It says, coexist. Have you seen that? Oh, yeah, I've seen lots of those. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I tell people, I don't want to coexist with them. <laughs> coexist. <laughs> yeah, while well, they're sawing my head off. Yeah, that's, that's right, coexist. And we want peace and love as they smash somebody over the head with a placard. <laughs> yeah, well, at least John Kerry finally was able to admit that there's a genocide of Christians in the Middle That's East. Right. We, we got that to happen, at least, but he, they did it in the in the smallest possible way. And, of course, by the way, we've sent another contingent of Marines to um, to the Middle East. Right, because the war is over. We're sending more Marines in, I, you know, and, and I'll get to all that later today. But, Professor, as always, I appreciate Thank your time. You. Thank you so much. All right, we'll talk to you Monday. There it is, uh, Alan Sachs, great guy, always here, a stand-up guy. I don't, I don't, I bet he's got the bun. What do you think? Always like that, you know. You know yeah, looks good. And come on, you're one of those. Admit it. You see somebody cruise by with the Bernie stickers and 27 other stickers in the window, you're going to you glance. Come on, I know you do. I know you do. It's all right. It's uh, <laughs> it's Monday here on the Steve Gruber Show. I'll be right back. This is Common Sense Radio. Straightforward and no excuses. Right. Come on now. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Call me crazy. Oh, yeah. What I said was perfectly right and spot on accurate. Boy's got a mouth like a cannon. Always shooting it all. Stop, 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 oh. stop, 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 stop. Got it yeah, stop. I mean, you're way off script. Got it in me. Gonna quit until it all comes out. Hey, boy. Yeah, you don't stop cynical. It's common sense. Pay attention to me when I'm talking to you. Genuine, accountable, and raw. Here is Steve Gruber. All right, and welcome to it, my friends. Did you see this major snub? The president, of course, flies to Cuba. The big deal, you know, breaking, you know, through for the first time. You know, how are you going to give Guantanamo Bay as a gift if, if your well, if your date to the party doesn't show up? Castro didn't even meet the plane. Complete snub to the president of the United States, the guy that's trying to show, hey, we can all get along. Well, again, that might work in the teacher's lounge, but in the real world, it doesn't work that well. And Barack Obama flies to Cuba, blump, da, 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 and it fizzles. Nothing. Nobody even meets the guy at the airport. I mean, how embarrassing is that, eh? I mean, it's raining, and you expect the cash to be there. What do you think he's going to do, kiss your cheek? No. <clears throat> he was thinking about a kiss, but, well, it was a little bit different, I suppose. Anyhow, so nobody meets the president. Nobody meets the president at the, it, 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 as he gets there, but um, believe me, he uh, he still thinks this is the right thing to do, and and um, that he's on the right track to uh, making history. Uh, here's a little bit about that. Uh, clip seven. Go. Well, it's so good to see everybody. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> well, as as our ambassador, uh, or chief of mission just stated, the uh, 
It's been nearly 90 years since the U.S. president uh, stepped foot in Cuba. For the first time in more than half a century, uh, as Jeff just noted, the American flag flies over a reopened U.S. embassy. And having a U.S. embassy here means that we're able to more effectively advance our interests and our values and understand the Cuban people uh, and their concerns. This is our very first stop. So this is a historic visit, and it's a historic opportunity to engage directly with the Cuban people and to forge new agreements and commercial deals, to build new ties between our two peoples, uh, and for me to lay out my vision for a future that's brighter than our past. And so excited, um, so excited were the Cubans to have him there that, well, just about nobody showed up, as you can hear, you know, 12 people and a crying baby. Uh, no Castro to be found, no no leader of Cuba to be found, no, well, not much of anything. Uh, okay, so where do we go from here on the campaign trail? Here's a headline today, just came out, just came out from the New York Post. And it says, will Hillary get charged or what? FBI Chief James Comey and his investigators are increasingly certain presidential nominee Hillary Clinton violated laws in handling classified government information through her private email server. That according to career agents. Some expect her, him to push for charges, but he faces a formidable obstacle. The political types in the White House who view a Clinton presidency as a third Obama term. With that, agents have been spreading the word, largely through associates in the private sector, that their boss is getting stonewalled. Despite uncovering compelling evidence, Clinton broke the law. Exactly what that evidence is and how and when it was uncovered during Comey's months-long inquiry has not been disclosed. For the record, the FBI had no comment on the matter, and government sources say no final decision has been made. Clinton denies she did anything wrong, claiming she had no idea she was getting classified information, a violation of federal law, on her private server during her years as Obama's Secretary of State, a failed term, by the way, because the documents she received contained no such headings. You see, that, 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 that's, um, that's an invalid defense. As the Secretary of State, your correspondence needs no such heading. You, Madam Secretary, make that determination. And therefore, if you make that determination, then you are in violation of federal law. Meanwhile, as FBI Director Comey can only recommend charges to the hacks in the Obama Justice Department, indeed, many law enforcement officials who know the FBI chief and the Bureau's inner workings believe the evidence would have to be overwhelming for Comey to even recommend charges, much less for the Department of Justice to pursue them. Still, some FBI staffers suggest the probes at a point where Comey might quit in protest if justice ignores a recommendation to pursue a criminal case against Hillary Clinton. Just how close Comey is to any recommendation, whether to indict or exonerate, is difficult to know, but agents believe the probe is nearing an end. A State Department staffer who set up Clinton's email server, for instance, was recently granted immunity from prosecution to provide Comey's team with evidence. And frankly, you don't start doing that unless there's something going on that's... um worth digging into. I'm also told Comey and his team increasingly doubt Clinton's story. Most officials know private email servers are easier to hack than secure government servers. They also know that even documents not labeled classified may be top secret. And that's why they're supposed to be sent through government accounts only. Those who don't follow the rules, like David Petraeus, have faced consequences. And what he did was marginal compared to what she has done. Marginal. Marginal compared to what she has done. Um, let's see here. We've got a couple more we can get to before we get to my next interview. I'm, I'm looking forward to because I want to talk to Nolan Finley about his never Trump stance and where that's going to take us. Uh, a Chinese military space station in a remote region of Argentina is shrouded in mystery, to say the least. Rumors have been swirling about the space station deep in the Patagonia region. In 2012, leaders in Beijing and Buenos Aires inked a deal to build a so-called deep space station, and the facility is expected to be completed by the end of 2016 this year. While Argentina and China have said the ground station in the southern hemisphere to support the program for moon exploration and other activities, there is a concern among some that the Chinese facility may have a more military purpose. 
The Chinese just scooped up a, a, a naval base in Australia as well, plus they're building the islands in the South China Sea that was international waters and should remain so. Uh, during the most recent presidential election, Mauricio Macri claimed that he would make public the secret clauses that have been rumored to have been added to the agreement. This agreement will allow China to count with a ground station in the Southern Hemisphere to support the program for moon exploration and other activities. Unlike the other space station in the South American country, an antenna in Argentina's central west Mendoza province built by the European Space Agency, the Chinese facility will be operated by the country's military. Officials in China have said that while military personnel would be running it, the facility would be a civilian operation and not operated by military personnel. Mm-hmm. I wonder what's going on with the Chinese, don't you Don't you wonder? All right, then. Uh, let's see here. If you're looking for room to grow, this is the week to do it. A new home in the country might be right for you. But with so many construction choices, how do you know which options offer the best value? Greenstone FCS is here to help. This week, Greenstone is holding a series of educational seminars on new home construction. Industry experts will cover a range of subjects, including how to make selections that add value to your home, being your own contractor, and pass to financing the project. Find out more at greenstonefcs.com slash seminar. Tell them Steve sent you. Back in a moment. Delivering Michigan common sense with a big dose of truth and honesty. <laughs> Welcome back to it. It's Monday here on the program. And... Um, Donald Trump on his way to Washington today to meet with a couple dozen top Republicans uh, at the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, the AIPAC get-together, a major pro-Israeli uh, group. It's the first time he's sat down with um, leading Republicans since last fall, put together in part by Alabama Senator Jeff Sessions, who has endorsed Donald Trump. Our next guest has certainly not endorsed Donald Trump. In fact, says he won't vote for him uh, under any circumstances. Nolan Finley, the op-ed editor for the Detroit News. And, and Nolan, before we get to that, though, I'd like to touch on your brand new book, Little Red Hen. First of all, welcome back. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. It's good to be with you this morning. So tell me about this book, Little Red Hen. Little Red Hen, a collection of column, columns from Detroit's conservative voice. It's some of, um, some of the columns from 16 years of writing this at the Detroit News. And, you know, there's a variety of, uh, of topics, variety of columns, ranging from the personal to politics, a lot about the city of Detroit, uh, you know, which I've been watching for almost 40 years now. Uh, and, you know, just um, had a good time pulling them together, and I hope folks have a, uh, have a good time reading them. You can get it on uh, Amazon or Barnes & Noble Milk or Apple iBooks. And, uh, you know, I hope people uh, give it a look. All the regular places, all right. So just make sure that I'm still in the right place as we uh, head into part two here. Are mm-hmm. you st- are you still with the hashtag Never Trump? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Or even more so. I, you know, I keep listening to what he says. Um, not you know, not simply um, about uh, about uh, you know the, the the some of the more inflammatory stuff that gets all the attention, but you know, on policy, on trade, on. Uh, you know, economics, and I, I just, uh, I can't get there. Well, and here's the thing, though. Um, um, some would say, I might even say, that uh, taking that position is a vote for Hillary Clinton uh, come the fall if she's the one, you know, because let me get 116 more people that work for uh, Bush 1 and 2 say that they will not vote or serve in a Trump administration. And Pat Buchanan says, good, let them go. Uh, Their departure testifies, according to to Buchanan, that Trump is offering something new and different from the foreign policy failures of the past, and we shouldn't be worried about that. We should stay with the trade, immigration, and intervention policies that Trump is talking about. So some real conservatives, my point being, are stepping up and saying what he's saying is good. You totally disagree. I disagree. And, you know, a lot of conservatives are saying, look, this guy isn't a conservative. Not by a long shot. And, you know, there's a reason you have this sort of civil war in the Republican Party. And it's not, uh, you know, it's not all because, you know, somehow the establishment out of touch with the, you know, with the people. I mean, you look at these policies and they are not conservative policies. They're very damaging policies from an economic standpoint. Um, it's, I, I think it's a very, 
he's wrong on issues across the board, and I just find him to be a very offensive, dangerous person. When you look at the voters here in Michigan and Pennsylvania and New Jersey and so forth in this part of the country, you'll find that voters support Donald Trump because he believes, as do many of the voters, that NAFTA is dangerous for the country, that the Trans-Pacific Partnership is dangerous for the country and for working people. Um, And that's what they believe. I would go back and um, um, uh, ask, invite them to read Amity Shell's The Forgotten Man and, and look at how these policies during the, during the Depression, these similar policies, uh, work to uh, prolong, um, prolong that economic disaster. Uh, every time the economy uh, started, started growing again, we'd slap another tariff on, another tax on, and things would go to hell again. I mean, these are policies that, you know, the, the labor movement, uh, the, the far-left Democrats have advocated for years, and they just don't work. We've got to believe in free markets. We've got to believe in the things that have, have made this country great. And not fight against them. And but his argument are is free trade and immigration. The Trump argument is it's 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 free trade, but the we're the only ones that are free traders. Everybody else is running tariffs. I mean, let's be honest. Our balance with China is negative. Our balance with Mexico is, is negative. Our balance. Every, so let me before we get there though, I, I want to back up a little bit. Uh, was Bob Dole conservative enough, or John McCain, or John Boehner? I mean, all honestly, in all honesty, I mean these are not conservative people that were you know leaders of the Republican Party in the last you know. They were very fine. They were very fine Republican leaders and very fine conservative leaders. Steve, if you think that um, a a a belief system that this this hard right belief system that a quarter of the people in this country at best adhere to is going to prevail in any election, I think you're dreaming. I mean, you, you, we've always in this country um, come to the middle when it came time to make practical, pragmatic decisions. And if we think we're not going to do that now, we're we're going to be sitting here in um, November 5th, and and a lot of folks will say, well, we've got our principles, um, but uh, we've we've got Hillary Clinton as president, and I'm afraid that's where we're at it. Well, that's my point. I mean, Ted Cruz is the hard right. Donald Trump is by far of that group you mentioned, the least conservative member of them in terms of true principle. I, I appreciate and plus, that. plus, you know, he strikes these strongman positions that have never been good for our country. Well, and I don't disagree with your point, but your hard conservative, Ted Cruz, can't win at this point, it doesn't appear. Um, the hard right candidates generally don't win um, uh, historically from what I've watched. So I'm trying to figure out what can, I mean, you're going to go to a brokered convention and, and and rig the rig the 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 rig the outcome. You'll have mass. Uh, How would that be hysteria. rigging the outcome if a guy doesn't get the amount of of? But if he does, uh, delegates. Well, if he does, he's got the nomination. Nation. But if he gets to the Cleveland and he doesn't have. The 1237 that you need, how would that be rigging the process? He didn't get it done. So I think you follow the rules. Fair enough. But then do you do you give it to a candidate that didn't win any states or won only one? That's my question. 20 seconds for the last word, my friend. Or maybe you maybe there's another name is put in the nomination, but that's what the rules allow, and that's how the process works. And I think there would not be rigging it; it would be following the rules. Give me a name. Well, you know, there's a lot of names out there. Um, you could go with a, a Paul Ryan. You could go with uh, a governor uh, who uh, who hasn't been in the race. All right. Nolan Finley, always uh, an interesting conversation. This one will continue for a few more months. Thank you so much, my friend. Thanks, Steve. There you have it. Nolan Finley, everybody. It's Monday on the Steve Gerber Show. Taking a closer look at the stories that affect you most with a big dose of common sense. Welcome back to it. Real quickly before we get to our next guest, Frank on the line and DeWitt to uh, offer his two cents. Frank, go. Hey, Steve. Uh, Nolan Finley ought to read his own paper because the headline says uh, Michigan this year to get 5,000 refugees. And still on the front page of the article, it says intelligent officials are expressing concern about being able to properly vet these people. So they're coming to an elementary school near you. We pay to bring them in. We pay 
to pay their welfare benefits to keep them comfortable, and we get to listen to the Democrats call us racist while we do it. And Nolan Finley's worried about Donald Trump. He is. Frank, thanks for checking in. Well, I think that Nolan Finley is one of those uh, never Trump people because he's some sort of, he thinks he's a conservative purist or something of that matter. But anyhow, thanks for checking in. Our next guest, Liz Peake, uh, columnist for Fox News and the Fiscal Times. Liz, welcome back. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so Nolan Finley, my good friend, op-ed uh, editor for the Detroit News here again, saying never Trump and that Trump's a bigger danger. And I said, well, you're going to elect Hillary Clinton. Well, then so be it. And I'm like, it makes no sense to me whatsoever. Yeah, I think actually, I think that the Republican establishment, if you want to call it that, is risks a backlash here. All we're hearing about is all these convoluted uh, programs that they're putting into effect to try and block Trump. And, you know, even people who may not like what Trump stands for or what he has to say, is, are, I think they're beginning to think, wait a minute, this is a democracy. If people want to vote for Donald Trump, if they want to go to his rally, so be it. I mean, he is clearly uh, providing a message by the way, note to the Republican Party, he is providing a message that people want to hear and that they've waited a long time to hear from Republican leaders, which is that Republican uh, Party and the platform actually does care about the working people of America. And I think, you know, I, I mean, I, I vacillate because some of the stuff he does really makes me horrified me and too. offends me. Uh, at the same time, he's bringing something to this campaign that kind of needed to be there. Yeah, and here's the thing. He has winning positions on trade, yeah. immigration, intervention, foreign policy, uh, and, and the list goes on and on and on. The fact of the matter is people uh, do want to have better trade policies and stop getting killed by the Chinese. People do want to stop uh, Muslims from coming <laughs> in until we figure it out. People do want to make sure that we um, are, are securing our southern border. And most people, believe it or not, do in fact want a wall. That Well, exactly. They want a secure border, however it is put in place. And the truth is we've been decades waiting for someone to do it. So it's a pretty reasonable uh, thing to, to campaign on. But here's an interesting thing which kind of occurred to me, reading about reading this morning all the outrage, et cetera, et cetera. What Trump also has done is leave the social agenda behind. You know, I mean, when Mitch Daniels was a figure, uh, leader, a leader in the Republican Party and establishment and so forth, he talked about focusing on economic issues, how to make the country stronger, and let's put aside for the moment abortion and same-sex marriage and other issues that Americans are kind of making up their own minds on. Let's focus, in other words, on things that can really impact people's income, help the country grow, etc. And no one is talking about this, but in fact, that's what Trump has done. He is not campaigning on the social issues that are very divisive, not only in the country, but also in the Republican Party. So to some degree, uh, you know, I applaud him for that. And the fact that all these very right-wing organizations are funding the block uh, Trump movement, if it is such a thing, you know what? I disagree with that. Well, you know, he, here's the thing. Um, the uh, Whether you like it or not, and, and maybe he didn't put it well, but the Republican establishment has taken us to places like Iraq, which didn't work in retrospect, and you, we can uh, 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 dissect that and, and parse it out, but the fact it didn't work. Yeah. Uh, it was a failure mm -hmm. as a war. It was a failure financially. Uh, we have immigration, you know, raiding the border. You know what? That didn't start when Barack Obama became president. It's been going on for decades, as you mentioned. And, and so there are a lot of things here that they can say, listen, here are problems. So wh what has the Republican elite given us anyway over the past uh, 20 years? Well, they've given us a very pro-business agenda. And I think what happened in doing that is that, in a sense, Republican politics got corrupted by big business, not That's small That's my business. point, because I was going to say, whose business? Yeah, pro business, I, but I whose? agree. And, and I think... You know, I have watched, for example, uh, scores of companies uh, doing business in China. Almost to a, a last one standing, they have been cheated by the Chinese. And I've gone to these conferences where business leaders from China and America extol the virtues of trade. It, you know, I, and I sit there thinking, this isn't right, because it actually isn't working for either our companies, believe it or not, or for the American people. So... There, there is a, you know, there is a legitimate message here, and that's what's sort of being, unfortunately, that's also what's being covered up by Trump's 
nonsense. I mean, if he, you know, let's get rid of the Megyn Kelly thing. What is that? Yeah, I mean, who cares? It, it looks incredibly stupid. It is uh, incredibly stupid. Yeah, and and let's just kind of get back to the themes and messages that really make his candidacy legitimate. And by the way, I think the next step for Trump uh, is to have a kitchen cabinet. And I've been sort of reaching out to some of the people who might populate that kitchen cabinet because he cannot do this on his own. And there are a huge number, I'm sure you run into them too, of reasonable people who just say, you know what, when he says his foreign policy advisors, I talked to myself, that's just not credible. He, need, he doesn't know anything, and he needs people to help him get to where he needs to be. Even if you say, and people say to me all the time, well, he's going to be like a CEO. He's just going to delegate. Okay, well, that's fine, but you have to delegate to somebody. Who is it? Who can give this guy credibility amongst the intelligentsia? Because I think that's very important as we go into, you know, these next races, which will perhaps determine whether or not there is a brokered convention and whether they try to take this away from him. I will tell you this. If there's a brokered convention, the Republicans lose badly. Uh, if totally. there's not a brokered convention, uh, if uh, Ted Cruz and Rubio and Kasich and whoever else is, you know has uh, delegates uh, can get behind him, the White House, Supreme Court, and Congress are all within, we all within reach because these economic themes, as you point out, do resonate and are winning. And the question that you have to ask yourself, am I better off? And am I safer than I was four years ago? Yeah, I think, and I think if, you know, with the alternative being Hillary Clinton, I cannot vote for Hillary Clinton. She's so corrupt, so completely, essentially dishonest uh, that, that I think, and by the way, she has pitched her campaign in a way that totally is good for Donald Trump. It is all about rounding up minority voters. So when we talk about the silent majority, they're all looking at that. They have to be and saying, well, wait a minute, you know, or her, is her incredible uh, focus on minority voters really the person I want representing me? Are her policies really for me, or is it just for Hispanics living in the country illegally, for example? Well, exactly. Nobody, nobody had, uh, you know, people don't support illegal aliens. Yeah. You know, we, we support legal immigration. Well, yes. pretty much, by and large, we support legal immigration. Those busting through... Uh, we don't support that. All right, I'll give you 20 seconds for the last word. Uh, well, it's an important couple of uh, primaries coming up tomorrow. Utah clearly will, I think, go big for Cruz. Arizona is going to be very interesting to watch. Uh, Trump's up in the polling, but it's not a huge lead, and there's a lot of pressure on that race. If they beat him, then Trump will not get to the 1237. All right, so Arizona, the one to watch. Liz Peek, always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Bye there now. Liz Peek, everybody here on the program. It's the Steve Gruber Show. We'll be back with the Mad Dog to break down the heartbreak. We'll be right back. Covering Michigan and the world from his bunker below the bridge, here is Steve Gruber. You know, it was a strange weekend, all right? So after the Michigan State loss, you know, I was out on Saturday and out on Sunday, and you could see in, in the eyes of these people this thousand-yard stare, seriously, of, of of Spartan fans who thought, you know, this this must be a mistake. You know, something's wrong here. Shell-shocked, thousand-yard stare. I mean, it's, it was like, I don't know, the joy was sucked out of this whole area. Uh, after that loss on Friday, Mad Dog uh, is here. Good with morning, me. Steve. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. Thanks. I mean, and you said you were down there with uh, Sam we, we, Vincent, Jay Vincent. Jay Vincent. I'm sorry. Watching this whole thing uh, come together and watching it live, and it, I turned the game on. I admit, I oh gosh, the game's on. I click it on. It's just just starting in the second half. So I'm watching and I'm working, but I'm watching it back. It was like a slow motion train wreck. I mean, it was hard to watch. And I'm you know I'm not a big Spartan fan. I, I support the home team, but mm -hmm. not the way some people are vested in it. Well, it, like I said, before we had gone on, it was one of the most debilitating losses in the history of any kind of athletics at Michigan State. I mean, they were propelled as a two seed, one and a half seed, and they got beat by 15, 16 seed. People can say what they want about this team should have been seeded here. Michigan State doesn't get beat by nine by Middle Tennessee. It just doesn't happen. And you're right. I mean, this is one of the most debilitating losses for a fan base economically also i mean you look at the beer gardens you oh, look at the Lord. merchandise you look at the travel now, i was talking about that earlier the the, the, the memorabilia the travel uh the bars the restaurants oh. the, everything and, and the hats the shirts the you know 
St. Louis is eight hours away. Chicago is three and a half hours away. So that's where they would have gone if they had got through the first round. But to get beat by a team like Middle Tennessee, it wasn't a fluke, wasn't a buzzer beater. They led the entire game. Michigan State would have a roll, get behind one, and then they just take the ball down and either fight. They shot 55 percent from the three it was ridiculous and they were they were unconscious but you know what they they changed up defenses they mixed it up on michigan state uh costello had his best game and denzel uh, had a double double but he had six turnovers and rest of the guys were like casper the ghost on a milk carton i mean you in a game <laughs> like that all i can say people ask me i have had a, a lot of people since that game and all i can say is they did not respect their opponent they looked past their opponent i know that years ago at a presser Tom Izzo came out after they got beat by Penn State on the road at Happy Valley. And flat out, he said, we didn't respect our opponent. And you've watched this in this tournament. Lower seeds, I think Michigan State, I don't think they thought they could fall out of bed and beat them. But they, they're, in their wildest dreams, they never thought Middle Tennessee was going to, you know, after they just beat Purdue and Maryland back-to-back in the weekend before. Right. Uh, according to, you know, Nate Silver, East Lansing native, runs mm-hmm. the uh, 538 blog, says it's the third biggest upset in, in NCAA history. Um, because he said uh, they had Michigan State ninety four point five percent chance of you know yeah well, 94.5%. no I, I'm not disagreeing with him yeah. on that yeah the only two that were bigger upsets in two thousand twelve Norfolk State beat Missouri and back in the nineties Coppin State beat South Carolina but you know a bigger upset than than the one most recently when Mercer dumped Duke in two thousand fourteen with Jabari Parker on that team right and 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 then Georgetown lost to um. I don't even know what FGCU is in 13, but they said it's a bigger upset than that. But anyway, Well, I mean, the whole thing is, I mean, and everybody, all all the Michigan fans and all people that remember the Appalachian State uh, win, <laughs> even though Appalachian State at that time wasn't a D1 school, it's still, I mean, if you want to compare it to it, it's very easy to compare. I mean, Middle Tennessee had no business beating State, but they did because they played well. It wasn't all right, a so let's talk about long-term then. Does it have a long-term effect or does it, because I know that Izzo has a great, a recruiting class coming in, right? Doesn't he have this fabulous yeah. class? Maybe he, his best ever. Well, it is his best ever. And Josh Jackson, a uh, Detroit native, but had gone to a California prep school. He still hasn't decided between Kansas and Michigan State. Uh, he is probably right now the best player that's a senior in high school. But if they get him along with the other four outstanding players, it'll be comparable to the Fab Five. Maybe even better. They already call it the class without him. They still have four great players coming in. Deontay Davis is not, uh, you know, it's too early to see if he's going to go pro. If he stays one more year, it'd be advantageous to him, I would imagine. And uh, right now there's not a scholarship for him. So somebody would be odd man out unless Deontay Davis did declare himself eligible for the pro. I guess the bigger point that I was making here, I mean, it's a devastating loss of the taste of this. It's going to be in your mouth for a while. Um, and like I said, I'm not a huge Sparty fan. I, I follow Sparty. I support the home team. But it's not the end of the road. I mean, this isn't like this is the last thing for Izzo, and man, it's just going to be off the rails from here. This is like a bad BM. It's just this. (laughs) It's just it's just that's exactly what this is. You can say that on my show. Not a lot of places you can do that here. Well, I mean, that's I didn't say anything that wasn't. uh, People are agreeing because they're like, yeah, it it is exactly what it is. You, you, these things take time to go away, and then they just will. It was a very debilitating loss. I think people are going to be in. Sticker shock for a long time, buck fever, whatever you want to say, for a while, mm-hmm. and uh, let the tournament move on. There was a lot of upsets. There has been a lot of upsets. Yeah. So, anyhow, going forward then, so when will we find out about this uh, this recruiting class? The other four are signed is what you're telling me. Well, they're yeah, yeah, they're all they're all ready to roll. Uh, I don't know. Maybe after the tournament. And this Kansas, uh, you know, is still alive. So, I don't know. Uh, he's good friends with the guys that are coming here. Miles Bridges, Cassius Winston will be Mr. Basketball. And uh, Let Jeremy Langford's this. cousin, that Jeremy Langford that played football at State, it's his cousin sure. from another state. Go ahead. Can this be a, a rally point for Spartans? I mean, to, to for big wins in the future. Can they turn it into a rally point saying, you know, we don't underestimate underestimate anyone. We work hard. We take everybody seriously, and, and they have a even stronger work ethic. Well, this isn't the end of the world. I mean, That's I, what I'm I, saying. I, I, this, this, listen, I mean, these things happen in sports. I mean, they just do. In sports, the, this stuff happens. You're either going to win or you're going to lose. You're either going to get upset, having a, just a, a unanimous craziness uh, effect of it, but I mean, Izzo is a professional coach, and, yeah. and right now, he is probably smarting, and he's hurting, and he, you know, he took not like some coaches, He, you know, the he took it on himself. Hey, this is our problem. I'm the head coach here. We lost. You just got to move on. It's just, it's unfortunate. 
And it, you just you think about it, you just shake your head. How did it happen? Then Syracuse is a ten uh, uh, ten seed, and they beat uh, them by Middle Tennessee yesterday by twenty five. The Blue Raiders were done raiding. They were done. They were All done. Right. All right, Mad Dog. Thank you, Steve. Dave Demarco, the I'm, Mad Dog. Everybody, I, I'm glad that I made it in. Uh, I'm glad too. <clears throat> Ivy would have hunted you down. Yeah. See you later. Uh, there, there goes the mad dog. He's out the door. That's that fast. 52 after on a Monday. It'll all be okay. Trust me, it'll all be okay. Back in a moment. This is Common Sense Radio. Straightforward and no excuses. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Call me crazy. What I said was perfectly right and spot on accurate. Boy's got a mouth like a cannon, always shooting it off. Stop, 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 stop. 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 I mean, you're way off script. Hey, boy. Yeah, you know, it's not cynical, it's common sense. Pay attention to me when I'm talking to you. Genuine, accountable, and wrong. Here is Steve Gruber. All right, welcome to it, my friends. Welcome to it. It is Monday here on the program. Uh, a lot going on this week. Obviously, the Spartan fans um, still reeling after that uh, incredibly debilitating was the word that uh, Mad Dog used. Uh, the debilitating loss of the Spartans to the Blue Raiders. That's it for that. Uh, also, um, Donald Trump in Washington today to meet with at least a couple dozen or more high-ranking Republicans uh, looking to find common ground to work toward to work toward the opportunity to put any divisions behind them as he continues to march toward the Republican nomination, uh, Arizona, extremely important tomorrow in the scheme of things. Um, Ted Cruz expected to win Utah, but Donald Trump, uh, doing very well in Arizona should do well enough to win that particular contest, which would keep him on track to picking up 1300 delegates. Well, more than needed for the nomination. The question is, what will that mean? What will that mean? Um, going forward for, for the party. Um, you know, and, and here's, I guess here's uh, one of the conclusions I arrived at over the weekend. Barack Obama rode to a pair of electoral college wins by sticking to his campaign theme of hope and change in America. And there's been plenty of change to go around, but many, many, it seems have lost their hope in, in this president's, in this president's, um, I don't know if you call it vision or whatever you would call it. Direction. How about that? In this president's direction, it seems that uh, many people have lost hope in where he's going. The national debt now nearly $20 trillion. More people are not working than at any time in my lifetime. Yeah, more people not working than at any time in my lifetime. Which means there's a lot of people out there that are, that are, that are hurting. Uh, there are far more people on welfare programs because of failed economic policies. Millions of people don't even bother to look for work. 47 million others getting food stamps each month. There is a growing level of despair that I personally have never witnessed. And you've seen it out there. You you know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about out there. The citizens of this nation have demanded border security and been ignored. They've demanded privacy from government intrusion. They have been ignored. Voters have made it clear they want the Obama agenda to be stopped, and they have been ignored. We want a stronger economy, a secure foreign policy, an end to illegal aliens flooding the country, better wages, a balanced budget, less intrusion, and more security, like I mentioned, and yet we have been ignored almost across the board. And this, in my estimation, is what has created this level of anger in the country. It is this that has developed... Well, this is what has brought us Donald Trump and the rise of Donald Trump and the rise of Bernie Sanders. I mean, how else could you explain the level of anger in the country today except that the voters have been ignored time and again when they say, here are our concerns. Here are the things that we care about. Let us be clear. Let us go and vote. I mean, Republicans are at historic levels in, in governorships and in state houses, in, in, the, in the Congress, 
in the House of Representatives, record levels. Record levels. It, 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 you know. But the, the Sanger is pointing out on the left and the right. On the left, like I said, Black Lives Matter and the Bernie Sanders campaign are manifestations. On the right, we've seen the rise of Donald Trump as this frustration boils to the surface. Barack Obama, meanwhile, the president seems to fan the flames of discontent by pitting each group against the other. Instead of being a cheerleader for the nation like, say, John Kennedy or Ronald Reagan, he seems far more predisposed to attacking America and its institutions for failures both real and imagined. It is time to reject his rhetoric across the board. It is time to embrace America and its institutions again and cheer for each other. It's time to spend the day talking about what makes us great and not what pulls us apart. And not what pulls us apart. It's time to admit that hope and change was nothing more than a bumper sticker and all we ever got by it was disappointed. Uh, I mean, that's that's really... Um, the truth, isn't it? All we ever got was disappointed by hope and change. Nothing ever really came from it. We never really accomplished anything, now did we? Uh, okay, so that big Arizona primary tomorrow, which is all important. The latest two polls, uh, and they're not real recent, most uh, the 8th and 11th of March, uh, both show Donald Trump with 12 to 14 point leads. We'll see how that uh, plays out going forward, but that's um, where it is at this point. 12 and 14 point leads for Donald Trump. Uh, another big headline that we haven't touched on yet this morning, but this is key. Uh, you probably heard that the uh, one of the key players in the attack on Paris, the terrorist attack on Paris, was captured in Belgium over the weekend, the top suspect in fact, and now he told investigators after he was captured that he was planning new operations from Brussels and possibly had access to several weapons and weapon types. Salah Abdeslam, Abdeslam had claimed that he was ready, to, I don't know how to get whatever, to restart something from Brussels. Maybe it's a reality, maybe it's not, but he looks like he was ready to go. Uh, before we hit the next break, let me head over to the Common Sense Hotline. Joe checking in from Grand Rapids today. Joe, welcome to the program. Yeah, I kind of agree with... Uh... Mr. Buchanan, um, you know, these these rhino wannabe conservatives that are whining about Trump, I think good riddance. You don't, you know, we come out and vote for you guys, and when you win, you still don't do anything. You don't secure the border. Uh, the tax code never gets reformed where it's actually fair and it's not a weapon. And, you know, they, they whine about broadening the base of the Republican Party. Trump's doing it. And they don't like it because he's not their guy. All these, you know, Glenn Beck, all these little whiny little, you know, <laughs> you know, want their way. They act like spoiled kids, man. Speaking you of know, Glenn I Beck, mean, it's like, uh, I think Glenn Beck may have, uh, he he may have left the reservation mentally. Um, something about this, you know, this is fulfilling Mormon prophecy now. I'm like, gee, Glenn, you know, I respect your right to practice whatever religion you want, and that's all fine and well, but he's uh He's a little bit far afield right now for me, Joe. Yeah, I don't. I, I haven't listened to him in a long time because if you listen to his show now, it's you'll have five minutes of some kind of current event or something about the economy, and the rest of his three-hour show is bashing Trump, and it's 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 ridiculous. And any politician, Cruz, any of these guys that they they hook up with him, it seems like it's a death sentence. I mean, it is. And the guy, you know. One week he's praising Rand Paul. Two weeks later he's bashing him. It's like, dude, you know. Get on the meds, dude. That's what I'm telling you. Joe, I got to run. Joe, thank you for listening. Grand Rapids, yeah, WJRW, the station in Grand Rapids, carrying the Steve Gruber Show along with 20 more statewide. Greatly appreciate your support this morning. And always, it's the Steve Gruber Show. We'll be right back.